Hello, hello, hello.
Hello, hello, hello. Good evening. How is Good evening. Everybody? Good evening. How is everybody? Good Good thank evening. you. Wonderful. Just giving the others a few more minutes to come in so we can get started. Did you get the amended note schedule that I sent you? We got an email with some documents. Yeah, an email with some documents attached to it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Got it a little later than I wanted to. I just had to make some changes and blah, blah, blah. But I'll talk a little bit about those documents tonight. So that uh, we can get the full picture going forward. Actually, they represent the actual schedule of reading uh, and, and lectures that we'll be having for the next few weeks. I was just trying to organize it in a fashion to make life a little bit easier for you and to get you to see uh, the structure and the study. Um, the read ahead that you can have and so on. But I'll talk about that as soon as folks get settled in a few moments. Uh, any questions while we wait, anyone? Something on the back of your mind, some question you may wanna ask about blah, blah, blah. Okay. Just remember you can raise them at any time. So while we wait, let's see who is here. I see Charles is here. Are you there, Charles? I don't know. Gia. Good evening, I'm here. Okay, wonderful. Just want to check you as registered. Let's see who else is on my list. And there, Adley. Dr. Adley is here. Oh, Dr. Adley is there. Excellent. Let me just take that. Look, Laura Stewart here. Laura is there. Okay, where's Laura on my list? Maria hmm. Dorset is okay. here. Okay, wonderful. Maria and Laura. Okay, great. Hmm. Laura, yes. So a week has passed already. Uh, did anybody have any common, uh, corporate governance issues come up since we met the last time? Any ethical issues come up? Nothing serious, apparently. Hi, good night. Marquita is here. Martina. Kido. Makita, hi Makita, how are you? I'm good. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's see where's Makita. Yes. Okay. Good evening, all. Charles is here as well. Is that Charles Newbold? The third, correct. Okie dokie. <laughs> way to go, way to go. The third. Okay. So Charles, are you planning to have a Charles New Bull the fourth one day? He's gone. I, I I tried and but instead I, I, I got a, a female version. Not my condolences. <laughs> You are in big trouble. <laughs> uh, tell me about it. I know. How old is that one? She is two. Two? Oh? Two. So, I am so sorry for you. However, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel about 47 years from now.
So just buckle down. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Let's see the doctor's batteries. Did we talk about the class time last time? Was it six to eight thirty or six to nine? Anybody remember? I recall it was six to eight thirty. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I think that's what we all agreed. What say I, you? I, I second that. <laughs> it's a good. That's what I remember. It's a good thing I haven't lost my mind yet. Well, I I almost thought it was six to eight. Just my foot be going <laughs> six to seven. Oh, all right. Point well taken. The official time is six to nine. However, um, I will keep you in mind. And the fact that you guys have worked all day and all that stuff. Uh, so as I get around 8.30 more, if I start going too much longer after that, I don't know, do something, make some noise, rattle, bark, whatever you need to do. And uh, I'll take the point. Okay, point well taken. Did I discuss your course assessment like how you will be graded? Yes. Okay. Yes, you did. Did I say 40% for your midterm, 40% for your final, 10% for participation and, and interaction and attendance and 10% for assignment? Sounds about right. Okay. So basically that's what we're looking at. The examinations will carry equal weight of 40% each. Uh, for showing up and making some noise, I give credit because I want you to make a little noise anyway. And uh, I will be giving an assignment of some kind, maybe a case study or something uh, for you to read through and uh, a little bit later and give some governance feedback. One of the boys sold it for $2.50. And they can't sort of a dollar fifty, right? Okay. Kia, is that you? Yes, I try and Kia. Oh, are you talking to me, but I can't I don't know how to do this. Yes, somebody's having a big conversation. Are they behind you, Kia? Okay. Are you still there, Kia? Yes. Can you hear me? I can. Very well. Okay. Okay, great. So we look like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven persons. So we can get started. I guess the others will join us along the way. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about before we get into any kind of lecture or discussion is the email I sent you um, yesterday, I think it was, uh, with some attachments. Now, if you have a look at those attachments, you will see that I think, I'm not sure if I outlined um, exactly how they're supposed to be lined up for the lectures, but let me just go over that just in case. Uh, everybody did not get that outline or structure. Uh, for example, today is considered week two for us. And so for week two today, uh, we'll be talking about the definition of uh, benefits and guiding principles of corporate governance. Okay, so you can make a note of that. And then next week, the plan is to talk about Central Bank of the Bahamas corporate governance guidance, or sorry, guidelines along with the discussion about the OECD corporate principles. That's for week number three, next week. And then our plan for week number four uh, will be Central Bank of the Bahamas guidelines, section two only. The rest of the guidelines is just a point of reference for anybody who needs it. But as far as the Central Bank guidelines, uh, section two only, if you scroll down the guidelines a little bit, you'll see that there's a section two not too far down. Uh, that's what we'll be discussing along with the OECD governance principles in week four. And then uh, the plan is, time permitting, 
uh, and we find uh, or by hook or by crook, one or the other, uh, we'll talk a little bit about ethics and governance um, with a little extract from ACAMS um, and their perspective. And just to kind of give you uh, a broad, as broad as possible perspective uh, about the governance side of things. Uh, and then, of course, once we've done those in week six, since we have 12 weeks to go, we're in week two already. That tells you time goes very quickly. So please make sure uh, you start reviewing early. Don't wait until the last minute to review. Uh, I have students who still wait for the last minute for some strange reason. I guess the adrenaline, uh, work commitments, COVID, whatever it is, a lot of issues to deal with. But I certainly encourage you to, to not wait until the last minute. Start reading and making your important notes early. So when the time comes to review, um, you wouldn't have to struggle. Okay? So tentatively then, your midterm exam will be week six. What date is that? Does anybody, can anybody see that right away? Week six, which date is that? Anybody has a calendar on their watch? Looks like I think February that's the 22nd. 22nd. Yes, the 22nd. 22nd. Okay. February 22nd. Excellent. Kiss my foot. That's the day before my wife's birthday. That means I have to worry about gifts and all that stuff again. Okay. So uh, make a note of that. Your midterm examination will be tentatively. Uh, week six on February the 22nd. And then of course, after your examination, the midterm is done, we'll get right into financial literacy and I'll certainly get uh, organized material for that in a similar way so that you'll know exactly uh, what we intend to do tentatively week after week. And then of course, after we're done with the financial literacy lectures, there'll be a final exam that will be non-cumulative it will only be based on financial literacy and accounts, all right? So you don't have to go back to rehash all of the corporate governance stuff again, all right? So just make sure you prepare well for the governance because once you're done, that'll be it, all right? Any questions? Okay. More housekeeping. Hmm. All right, so if there are no questions, then let me get the ball rolling. Uh, I just want you to know that I'm not going to be doing all the yapping. I'm going to have you get involved at some point, um, which will, of course, any involvement on your part will give you credit. You're not just blowing hot air, uh, as well as being involved and getting credit. I'm hoping that the involvement will keep us all engaged and even help us to remember some of the key stuff going forward, not only for your examination, but also for, for after for the semester is over, for the world of work, all right? But let me get the ball rolling to, uh, by talking a little bit about what is corporate governance, okay? This would be the first um, document that I sent you, the definition of governance, scope and benefits. And I, and I want to open up by saying that basically corporate governance has to do with the way an organization is governed, how we run the organization on a day-to-day -day basis um, is basically what we mean by governance. Now, there are two types of governance that you need to know. There's good governance and there's bad governance. What we will be talking about this semester is all good governance. And by extension, you can assume that anything that we say, as far as good governance is concerned, the opposite of that thing would be considered bad governance. So if you see you find yourself after our discussions doing any of the opposite things, then you know you're in the wrong lane. All right, everything we talk, we'll be talking about this semester will have to do with what you ought to be doing. And that is the good stuff, right? Uh, also, it is important to highlight 
who the participants are in the governance process. Right? So if the entity is going to be run a certain way, the right way, uh, then we need to know who the key players are. And for our purposes, the key players in any governance process for any organization, whether it's profit or non-profit, uh, are the shareholders, the board of directors, and senior management. They are the participants. They are the key participants. They are the culprits in this whole thing. They are the ones that make it or break it. Okay? Now, let me ask you guys a question before I go on. Does everybody know who shareholders are? Who are shareholders? Anyone? The owners of the business. Yeah, the shareholders are the owners. Simple as that. So if you own a small business, and you own all the shares and there are no other shareholders, then you are the sole owner of that business. Okay? If it's a company incorporated by shares. Similarly, if you buy one share in Amazon, even though you only own one share, you are still a part owner of that company because of the one share that you hold. So shareholders then are by definition, the owners of the company. Shareholders are interested in two things. And this is why they're interested in governance. Shareholders are interested in their share prices going up and up and up. They don't like down. Shareholders are also interested in how often and how much dividends the company will be paying them preferably on an annual basis. Okay? Those are the two concerns of shareholders. Why are they concerned? Because it's their money that they have invested in the company and they expect to earn a return on their investment. I'm sure if any of you put money into any kind of investment or company or entity, you expect a return on your investment. Okay? If you're a shareholder, you expect your share prices to go up and you expect to be paid dividends uh, on an increasing basis, preferably on a regular basis, preferably on an annual basis. Now, you may or may not know that uh, the board of directors are actually the persons responsible for, responsible for declaring and paying dividends. They are not obligated by law to pay dividends every year. The board will pay a dividend according to the company's ability to pay, and God knows what else. But basically, they, they should be paying dividends to shareholders as regularly as they can, and as large amounts as cash flow would, would allow them to. Now, oftentimes, there's always fighting between board members and shareholders about share prices and dividend payments, but that is something we'll see uh, perhaps a little later on. The key issue here is that shareholders happens to be the primary stakeholder uh, in any company, and they are interested in proper governance because they have uh, an inherent interest in the company. Many shareholders have invested millions of dollars in companies, depending on the size of the firm. So they don't wanna hear anything about poor governance because poor governance leads to poor reputation. Poor reputation leads to regulators coming in and fining companies imprisoning directors and so on. And of course, all of these things lead to reputational damage. So if you're a member of any board, or if you become a member and your shareholders are constantly asking about the governance of their company, which they should be, then now you know why. Poor governance has grave consequences for shareholders. Uh, the second group of participants are the board of directors. These persons are appointed by the shareholders. And their job, God forbid, is to make the long-term strategic decisions for this company and to ensure that whatever governance requirements are necessary, ethical decisions that need to be made, um, good sense financial decisions that need to be made, that they are making them 
that they are not putting the company in jeopardy because of their own self-interest program. Okay? And so that is the primary directive. The shareholders do not want to get involved in the normal petty day-to-day -day running of the company, not petty, but the normal day-to-day -day running of the company. They have other people who will do that. Their job is to meet uh, at least once every once, maybe once a month, once every three months, to sit down and talk about where will this company be in three years, five years, 10 years? And if there are any regulatory or other problems, what needs to be done before we suffer any reputational damage? Okay? If you're a bank, you can lose your license, you can be fined tens of millions of dollars, all this kind of stuff. So they, their, their job is to make sure that these things are done and they're done properly so that the shareholders' investments will not be in jeopardy and that they will not put the company in jeopardy because of poor decisions or, God forbid, uh, conflict of interest issues. Uh, before I go on, does anybody know what a conflict of interest is? Anybody? What is a conflict of interest? I'm the only one who knows what a conflict of interest is. A conflict of interest could be, for example, um, let's just say in a company and you are the manager in a department, but your son works for you. Okay. If he does something wrong, are you gonna um, discipline him as a worker or as a child, as a, or, or not discipline him because he's your child. That could be a conflict of interest because he might not get the discipline that you would give a regular worker. That's a conflict of interest. It is definitely a conflict of interest, okay? And it is not uncommon uh, for organizations to have family members, which is why many organizations discourage uh, the hiring of family members, especially in the same branch or the same uh, building or even the same organization for that, for, for that matter. Um, oftentimes, for example, when persons fall in love at work and decide to get married, people still fall in love at work. <laughs> hey, I am sure we still do. Uh, when I was a young banker, people fell in love all the time, I understand. And some of them even got married eventually. And oftentimes when, if they do get married, uh, the organization would either transfer one or the other to a completely different section of the, of the bank, or in some cases, depending on the situation, encourage one to resign if they believe that there's a great potential for conflict of interest that can harm the organization, okay? So it's important uh, in our discussion on governance uh, to make sure that we discuss the issues and, and we will see those later on this evening but to make sure that we stay away as board members from conflict of interest issues uh, because oftentimes they can be very devastating to the persons involved and certainly um, to the organization as a whole. Uh, all too often, for example, board members uh, might be sitting on a board and they privy the information and they might use that information like inside information to make investments and trading which is illegal by the way um, in the united states and in the bahamas insider trading it's illegal uh, you're not supposed to make trading decisions or give inside information to family and friends so that they can purchase securities because of the information they have inside as a board member in the firm that is wrong that is illegal uh, but Board members still do it from time to time. They shouldn't. Uh, oftentimes, board members, um, because of the information that they uh, acquire as board members, they go out and they um, tell competitors for a fee. They disclose information from the firm so that they can get certain privileges from competitors and all this crazy stuff. And sometimes, in some cases, they even conduct what we call industrial espionage, where they are sitting on the board where they release spies for competitors. Uh, so you can see at this level in, in the company, uh, governance can be seriously impaired if there is a lack of integrity on behalf of 
board members in particular. Okay? Something to seriously keep in mind if you, if you are sitting on a board and if you ever sit on a board. Okay? One of the reasons also uh, that you may have seen around oftentimes, as you, can, as you can see, when a company needs a board member, it doesn't advertise in the newspaper like other jobs. It doesn't say, oh, we need a board member sending your resume and we have a look at it and we think you're great for our company based on your background, experience, and integrity, and so on. We would like to invite you to the board. That doesn't happen. Board members are usually selected privately among certain groups. And so if we look around, for example, depending on who's in power in a particular political environment, uh, all the board members tend to be government board members, for example, tend to be people who are affiliated with a particular party or who are generals for a particular party and so on, whether or not they're qualified for the job. Uh, this is just what happens. In the private sector, we have versions of that where persons select board members, a person say no. Uh, somebody recommends them, a friend told them, somebody needs a job they know. Whatever the reasons are, uh, all, oftentimes board members are not selected purely uh, for their integrity and their competence. And in essence, those should be the leading factors, which probably explains why a lot of companies suffer certain indignities along the way. Some are big enough to survive, some of them do not survive. Right? Uh, but um, all of this, yes, question. Uh, not a question. Um, our board members, well, credit unions, our board members are actually elected by the, the members, the shareholders. Yes, by the members. Okay. Um, how, how, how are the members, uh, they are they're allowed to make their independent selections or persons can go to them and campaign and say, will you vote for me? How does it work in, in, in that? We can campaign. Um, um, persons nominate, uh, nomination committee receives the nomination and yeah. they do their vetting. And then the, act, the candidates can um, campaign. And on a day of the AGM, it's one member, one vote. One member, one vote, yes. At least that creates an environment where issues of conflict of interest are significantly reduced. In other words, the board doesn't get to select, quote unquote, their people, which is a good thing. And, and I think credit unions have always been doing this in order to minimize or reduce significantly that kind of stuff. And that's one of the advantages that credit unions have over other private sector firms who the board will sit down and say, uh, let me select uh, Sir Harry Oates because he, he's not really dead and he's very famous and rich or whatever the case might be. And they say, fine, Harry it'll be. Uh, and and, and the, in the case of the union, it's not that simple. Uh, and, I, and I think that's oftentimes uh, an excellent way to go about it to get rid of some of that uh, conflict of interest stuff. Um, it has been said uh, that in the Bahamas, for example, one of the reasons why we have um, a lot of issues politically, because we, you know, we only have two or three political parties. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, I think you all have an idea how that goes depending on the situation. But it has been said, for example, that perhaps we need to get to a point where parties do not uh, delegate or, or pick persons to run. But instead, we should go to the, what the United States does and anybody can run for a constituency. We call them primaries, like just like the union members select their board people by vote. So we have primaries, so anybody can run. And whoever wins the primary will run in that particular constituency. Uh, and that again would reduce some of the pressure and some of the politics of the situation. And so, yeah, depending on how board members are selected, uh, the governance of the organization will either get better, remain the same, or God forbid, get worse, unfortunately. 
So, but the point I want to make is, this is why it is so important for the right things to be done at the board level, because it is at that highest level in the organization. And remember, at the board level, two critical groups are relying on boards to make good decisions, not selfish ones, not political ones, not personal ones, none of that stuff. The two key groups are relying on boards uh, to make proper governance decisions. Governance meaning what is good for the firm and what is good only, okay? For the firm only. And that, who are those two groups? The shareholders who put their money into the firm, the shareholders who put their money into the firm, the shareholders who put their money into the firm, that group. And then the other group are the managers and staff who are relying on that firm to do the right thing so that their jobs can be continued, so that they can get more bonuses, so that they can have uh, confidence in the organization that they work for. So a lot of weight lies upon what boards do. And this is why you'll see, if you haven't seen already, a whole lot of discussion, if not most of discussion on governance issues has to do with what is required of the board. Many organizations are suffering as we speak because boards are not doing their jobs. A lot of board members think that they're there just to fill their pockets, eat caviar, fly around to exotic places, or whatever some board members do in certain entities, or to manipulate the system and so on, play politics, whatever it is they're doing. Those are not the requirements for boards, okay? Boards are there to do two things. One, to run the firm in a way that shareholders can see increases in the value of their shares and dividends being paid regularly. And on the other hand, employees, managers, and staff can be comforted that their organization is being run reliably and reputationally well so that they can continue on as an entity and they can have confidence in the job that they go to every single day. Not to mention those companies that are holding pensions for persons in the gazillions of dollars. Uh, I'm sure one of you may have heard about Enron, yes? Anybody? You ever heard about Enron? No? Yes. Okay, Maria. For those of you who have not heard about Enron, when you get a moment sometime this week, Google it, Enron, E-N-R-O-N, and you will discover that Enron was a multi-billion dollar company. What Enron did eventually, they started cooking the books, which is why I have the financial side of this governance class, because a great deal of proper governance has to do with how we manage the finances, not just the board discussions about strategic decisions, but also what decisions the board making regarding the financial position of the firm? Because remember, all the multi-million dollar investments and other fin major financial decisions, they have to be approved where? At the board level. So if they're reckless with it, organizations fail or suffer. In the case of Enron, somehow the buddies on the board got together and decided that they were going to cook the books. What does that mean? They told the CFO, who was on the board as well, the chief financial officer, to go back to the accounting records and to record several billion dollars of sales that never occurred. Because they wanted the financial statements to reflect a better than expected position. Clearly, that is wrong. In addition to that, they had all kinds of off the records transactions, liabilities that they did not report to shareholders and other stakeholders like governments and their lenders. And so eventually it got to a point where Enron was not able to pay its debts. And eventually the entire multi-billion dollar company collapsed 
because of poor governance. Right? Poor governance. And in that multi-billion dollar company was tens of millions of dollars in pension funds that persons who worked for the company for 20, 30, 40 years, their entire life savings went down the drain. What did they get back? Nothing. Some of the persons who worked there, if you read long enough, even committed suicide. They couldn't live with the fact that their entire life savings were gone. So the point I'm making here is this governance thing that I'm talking to you guys about for the next few weeks, this is not just for academic purposes, like to get through an examination or two. By no means, this is serious stuff with major, major implications for organizations of all kinds, whether they are profit or not for profit. So if you're the treasurer of your church money and Bishop Tingham is doing some stuff that he ought not to be doing, and at the next elders meeting, nobody like Bishop Tingham and Deacon, somebody does not want to give information about what's going on, then you might have a governance issue in the name of Jesus. Even, what is the point I'm making? Governance issues are not just for financial institutions somewhere in the world and in the Bahamas. It is a worldwide thing for all kinds of entities whether they're profit or not for profit, okay? All right, so, so I, if you haven't heard about Enron, it's a classic case of poor governance going very, very, very bad. And I encourage each and every one of you to at least look it up and take a read. I believe you'll find it quite interesting. All right, so governance has to do with how we run organizations, how well we run them, uh, and making sure that the participants, uh, the three participants are doing their job. The third group of participants, of course, are none other than senior management. And again, just like board members, we have two types of senior management persons. There are the, well, maybe three, the good, the bad and the ugly, maybe. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Ah, nobody likes to have this kind of discussion um, in the formal environments of boards and on the job and all that stuff because it's not politically correct. However, when we're doing it academically, like we're doing now, we have a little leverage to have this discussion because these are the realities as well. Please. Okay? And that's why I am putting it to you as students so that when you get out there, if you see some of this stuff happening, you'll know, first of all, how to protect yourself. And if you're bold enough, you'll have some information by the end of the semester to maybe change the course of certain things if necessary. Really, that is what it's supposed to be about, okay? How to protect yourself and how to protect your organization. Especially if you sit on boards, your compliance, your MLRO, your CEOs, your CFOs, your middle management, and even as employees, you'll discover later that you're all mixed up in this governance thing as well. Okay, so basically nobody's exempted. So the third tier uh, is senior management. Who makes up senior management? The CEO, the chief executive officer the CFO, the chief financial officer, and any other O's, like the senior legal officer, the senior marketing officer, the senior audit officer, the senior, whoever they are, they are the ones that make up senior management. And their job is to take directives from the board, implement them throughout the organization and make sure they work. Senior management. Some of them do a great job of it, some of them do a not so great job of it. And some of them do a fairly lousy job. 
And again, the reasons why we have these different levels of performance has to do with governance issues, competency issues, integrity issues, ethical issues. Hmm. Okay. I know it sounds like a doomsday, but it's not really doomsday. I'm just putting it that way to help you to remember how serious this thing could be. So that if you're ever confronted with it, you'll not only have the academic background to deal with it, but you will have the intensity bearing down on your neck, like wait one cotton picking minute. What the hell are you really asking me to do? Mr. and Mrs. Jones on this bloody board or wherever it is, okay? All right. I'm just pausing for a moment to finish my register. Thea. Hi. Hi, Thea, how are you? I'm on the road, so I'm tuning in from my phone. Well done, let's talk about technology. Uh, you can drive and listen at the same time? Yes, sir. There you go. So this, what do we call that again? Multitasking. Yeah, multi. <laughs> oh, darn it. All right. So make sure you don't take your eyes off the road, Thea. That's no, <laughs> I expect to see you next week. I don't want no horse there and cow fat. <laughs> All right. Who else? There? Uh, Ronaldo. Present. Okay. Let me make sure I have you. On my hit list, Ronaldo. Yes. Great. Uh, is there anybody? Okay, I think that's all of us. All right. So those are the three participants who have the primary responsibility for dealing with governance issues. Uh, out of the three, of course, the board has the ultimate authority. Everything must go through the board whether it's coming from the shareholders down or the senior management up, the board has ultimate authority, which is why when boards do not do their jobs properly at the next board meeting, they try to hide stuff so shareholders don't kick them out. The shareholders still get information if somebody blows a whistle or they find out otherwise, then they sit to change certain board members at the next shareholders meeting and put in new board members who they believe will do what is required uh, for shareholders in particular, first and foremost. Shareholders are not concerned about anybody's problems. Their main concern is you have my money, I expect my share value to go up, I expect to be paid dividends as a return on my investment, and yes, I will listen to your complaints, Mr. Board members and Mr. and Mrs. Senior Management. However, at the end of the day, those are the two <laughs> criteria that I will determine your future on, okay? which is why oftentimes you might find yourself on a board or find yourself in an environment of a board to try to manipulate shareholders to get their way, even though they're not doing their jobs properly. They try to get friendly and political and acquainted and whatever they do to try and get, keep shareholders at bay. And, and certainly senior management does everything it's good, uh, good, uh, uh, not so good and ugly, depending on what it is, to keep the board members so again, uh, as we speak about these things, remember there's always two sides to the story. Those who are doing the right thing and those who are doing the wrong thing. You, going forward in your professional lives, if not already, will have to decide which side of the fence you're going to be on when that time comes. It's a great thing to be invited to a board. It's a great thing to be a part of senior management, but you must understand that there are a lot of issues at hand. A lot of persons in these capacities don't seem to worry so much about it because usually by the time they get to that level, everybody's already quote unquote connected. Not everybody, a lot of people. And so they kind of cover each other. That's not the way it should work. It's supposed to be open, transparent, which we'll talk about later and free of bias and politics and all this stuff, but we know in the real world, that doesn't always happen. What you have to decide is what side of the fence when your time comes, you will be on, right? All right. 
but the board has ultimate responsibility for governance and of course strategic planning whenever you have the term strategic planning you should be thinking long term okay uh in day-to-day -day business discussion we, we usually talk about three terms short term which is the day-to-day -day stuff medium term which is the three to five year stuff and then long term which is the seven ten twenty years and further down the road the board members usually would be in the long-term sector uh senior management would be in the medium-term sector and certainly middle managers and supervisors etc would be caught up with the day-to-day and together they expected to make things work to help the company to grow and to protect the company's reputation God forbid. all right so what are some of the things we should expect to see as far as proper governance are concerned well Transparency is the key. The organization should be open. You should be prepared as board members to answer questions to shareholders, whatever they may ask, to senior management who requires it, and vice versa. There shouldn't be a case where board members and senior management people are hiding information from shareholders and employees. Okay? Happens all the time, but that is not what is required. Sometimes boards even get auditors, God forbid, who are supposed to be independent. To come in, see that things, certain things are wrong, and because of their quote unquote relationship, sometimes certain boards are able to get auditors to collude with them, to fail to disclose important information about the firm's performance, that the auditors in their professional independent positions ought to do no matter what. It's not even, it shouldn't even be debatable. Yet, if you do some research, you'll discover that there are some auditors and audit firms that have been fined millions of dollars for colluding with senior management and boards, not disclosing, hiding information, and all this crazy stuff. It's an absolute no-no. In fact, when auditors do that, then that's poor governance on the part of the auditors. As a matter of fact, later this week, I'm supposed to be starting my auditing class where part of my discussion is going to be about the PCAOB, which is a group of people that have been set up in the United States to watch the auditors now, because so many auditing firms have been accused of poor governance in their own auditing firms. That's spooky, students. Again, uh, I wish in any discussion of governance, I could just say these are the things that are good and proper that we need to do, which I will say. But it would be remiss of me not to mention some of the things that are improper that are going on, just in case you find yourself confronted with some things. Hopefully, you'll make the right decisions. Remember, some get away, but not all. All right. Speaking about transparency, has anybody heard the expression in the Bahamas lately called sovereign fund? Am I the only one? Nobody's ever heard that term, sovereign fund? In the yeah, Bahamas? it's been. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we're familiar with the terminology. Um, I mean, it's been in the media for the past couple of weeks. It has. Who brought, who brought it up? Anybody knows? What you mean, who initially brought it up? Yeah, in the Bahamas a few weeks ago. The Prime Minister. None other. No. There has been discussion about a sovereign fund years and years ago. It's nothing new. Uh, it has come back up again for certain reasons. Anybody know the reason? 
and not know the reason. Have you heard what some of the reasons were that were given? Mm. Well, you know there's a discussion about something Ar called aragonite in the Bahamas? Aragonite, yeah. yeah. And some other natural resources? And Julie, yeah. you've heard those yeah. things? Yeah, um, oh. we have, we have, you have legislation that talks about, um, that talks about um, basically naturalization and, and, and commodities that's supposed to be the, the rights of the citizens. I'm Indeed. trying to remember the exact legislation that's, that's not, not to worry, the legislation is not hard to find. What's important is, are you aware of it and are you aware of what it means? And you are, are you aware of the governance implications of it? That's the reason why I brought it up, okay? Remember this governance thing you're doing? Yes, you're gonna pass an exam, doggone it. But more importantly, like what does it really mean in practice? Because remember in the old days, they had an expression, guys, that any fool can get married. You ever heard that? No? Am I the only one on this planet? Say again. Any fool can get married. Never heard of that. Never heard of that. My, my, my. You guys are still babes in swallowing clothes. Well, here's what it means. It means any fool can get married. But what the old people from back in the day meant was that once you get married, then if you're not prepared or equipped for the long-term requirements of that marriage, what will generally happen? Anyone? Divorce. Of course, or you live in pain and suffering until the old people say you're dead. Anybody ever heard of that word, that word dead? Yes. Okay. Ah, God damn it. Okay, I don't feel completely like an antique. Okay. What they meant was, uh, it's important to try and be as prepared as possible uh, before, and then when you get into it, and blah, 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 which includes being transparent, being good governance, you can't be doing crazy stuff, or else the whole institution is going to collapse. Organizations are like that, folks. That, the old people didn't know anything about this discussion, you're having a corporate governance and board of directors, and all. they didn't know a damn thing about that. But they knew about it from the institution of marriage and relationships. So that's what they talked about. But basically, if you don't apply the proper governance issues, it, organizations will crash just like marriages. Same principle. And part of it has to do with what? That word I told you, transparency, openness, freedom of information act. Anybody heard of that one? Well done. Yes. Okay. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Wonderful. I'm happy to hear that because this is going to be important governance issues for you guys going forward. Not so much for me anymore because I'm headed towards the right this way. Anybody see which direction I'm going? Which direction am I going? All the same. Okay. I've already been there, done that, made noise, tried to get people to change stuff, got beat up for it. Anything I tried to suggest that was the right thing, they beat me down to death, took my pit, my bonuses, took promotions, all kinds of crazy stuff. Because I was trying to do, like from I was young, I thought, oh, I'm here to fix things. And didn't I get beat up for trying to fix things every time? I'm not saying you shouldn't. Just know that when you try and fix things, there are consequences. Because basically, oftentimes, folks want you to go with the flow. Good governance is not about going with the flow. Good governance is about doing what is right, what is transparent, what is open, see? Whether it's the board level, senior management level, middle management level, lower levels, doesn't matter. It's all the same requirement. Yeah. Unfortunately, in the real world, it doesn't always work that way, okay? So trying Let's to check they actually they actually does they actually do have a sovereign wealth fund act. Yes, we do. Yeah. And for those of you who may not be aware of the purpose of that act, 
it is supposed to be an art design so that we find any wealth from our natural resources that the, the share that we get from it will go into the sovereign fund to be made available to every single raw born Bahamian. Whether it's distributed like dividends or used for the public good or both. Now, uh, when money will end up in that fund and how much and based on what is a whole other issue for you young sister to deal with going forward. But it's nice to be aware of the issue itself and the issue of governance surrounding the issue. Because if it's not properly governed, what do you think is going to happen to the sovereign fund? It is going to be under the consolidated fund. Well, some, yeah. The same it's, thing would happen to, to NIB. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. In part, absolutely. Some of it will end up in the consolidated fund somehow without any information, without any transparency. Nobody's going to tell you. And then some of it will end up in. Uh, do they have private accounts in Switzerland still? After all the. Well, some is going to end up other places. Point I'm making is all this stuff is relevant to governance. Remember, we're using the term folks, corporate governance to refer to organizations. Uh, and just about everything in our atmosphere is an organization of some kind. Even the government of every country is an organization. Okay? The shareholders of the Bahamas are Bahamians, so at least supposed to be just like the just like Dr. Adi's membership at the union. We are supposed, we are supposed to be the owners of the country or the, or the company, which is the country. The people we elect, they're the board of directors. And then the, 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 the department heads and deputy this and deputy and director, this, uh, they are the senior management, then the rest of us. So it's one big old corporation, except it doesn't really work that way, but that's what it's supposed to be. And even as a country, we are supposed to be governed by proper governance. See, that's why we said govern yourselves accordingly. That's where it came from. My, my, my. What was that? Transparency. So, a key to good governance is transparency. Any organization, profit or non profit, country, island, state, wherever the hell it is that you go into and there's no transparency, dog eat your lunch eventually. Okay. Uh, in addition to transparency, good governance and walls that we call balanced economic development. In other words, the company should be looking for ways to keep it steady for the long term for everybody. If it's a company, if it's a country, same thing. Uh, run it in such a way that everybody ultimately benefits in some form or another in the long run, in the next generation, in the next generation of employees, even. For example, Bank of Nova Scotia and Royal Bank have been in the Bahamas since 1908, 10, some crap like that. 100 years or so, more. When I went to work at Scotia Bank as a youngster, I met some old folk from long before. They were the old folks at the time. I was the youngster, 21, my Afro. Um, you know, I was slim and ready to go, ready to conquer the world. And now when I walk into Bank of Nova Scotia or Royal Bank or whatever, I see a new generation. Now I'm the old people, so to speak. Oh, but the point I'm making is, no matter what the time, organizations are supposed to run itself in such a way that no, not only is it transparent, but it also is run and balanced in such a way economically and financially that it'll run for generations. That is supposed to be the goal. Some board members and some senior finance, um, management people, they're not in the organization for the long run. Many of them are in the organizations just to do what? Anybody know? Make a guess. Money. For whom? For themselves. Of course. Nothing wrong making money if it's designed for the long-term management and running of the firm future. That's what you're there for. But a lot of folks go in not because they're interested in the future of the firm, but rather in their own pockets.
And then of course, let's not forget, as I said earlier, that in addition to transparency and balanced economic development, we have this issue of looking after the interests of the owners of the company. So if you're a board and senior management, your ultimate goal always is to make sure your shareholders are satisfied and happy. Not you necessarily, if you happen to be at the end of the day because you get paid and you get some benefits and all this kind of stuff and, and you get to do some stuff, then fine. But ultimately your goal is to satisfy the shareholders. Without them, there'd be no company. Same thing on a country level. The goal of any government, anywhere, any time of any persuasion is supposed to be to satisfy the interests of the, of the, of the, Can I repeat? the people, of the people. Of the people, the goal, just like organizations, goal is to satisfy the shareholders first and foremost, the goal of the government of any country, which is an entity in itself, is to satisfy the future and objectives of its people. It's, a, it's very simple if we are doing the governance thing right. The reason why governance and things suffer is because we continue to do the wrong things. This is why we study governance issues. We study what is requirement. We fuss about it. We learn it. We uh, test it on it. We are challenged by it. So that at the end of the day, hopefully, more people than not will make those transparency, development, interest decisions, whereby everybody basically, ultimately, will be the beneficiaries in some form or another. My, my, my. Uh, suffice it to say that it's easier said than done, but it is doable once we make up our minds to do it. Okay. And then finally, for my part of the yapping of the apps long enough, I think, for the moment, uh, before we get into the guidings, uh, the guidelines and principles of corporate governance, which entails a whole lot of interesting stuff, by the way, which you'll see if you haven't started your reading yet. Uh, let's, let's look at that first hand that I sent you. Uh, if you go to the bottom of it, you'll see something called benefits of corporate governance. Benefits of corporate governance. Uh, I sent those handouts yesterday. If anybody didn't get that email with the handouts, please send me an email and say, I didn't get that handout. So I can send them to you. So there are several benefits that I've noted here to top off my discussion on corporate governance. And the first one has to do with ensuring the corporate success and economic growth. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what I was just talking about. How do you ensure corporate success? Well, it comes through some transparency, openness. Excuse me, Mr. Wilkinson, what, what did you say the document is called? Benefits of corporate governance? Uh, at the bottom of that page. The, the, the document itself is headed definition uh, and benefits of corporate governance, the first handout. Do you see it? If you go to the bottom, you see benefits of corporate governance. I thought I had this open, hold on a second. No problem. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, so number one, right off the top, uh, good governance ensures corporate success. How do we ensure corporate success? Well, transparency uh, and, 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 and as you'll see later on, good ethics, very important. Economic growth by not cooking the books and not messing around financial information and not manipulating financial information and not getting bloody auditors to lie for you. When I say for you, I mean for the board of directors and senior management persons who might seek to do this. Okay? If we don't do those things, then we see, we see great benefits. Organizations go on from one decade to the next. Some of them even go on for centuries. God forbid. All right. Uh, the other thing about benefits of good governance 
uh, investors who are interested in putting money into your company, no matter what type of company you have, it instills great customer confidence, as you can see. When there's great customer confidence, when the company needs to borrow money, it is easier for them to raise capital, cheaper for them to raise capital because the market knows that this company does good business. There are no bad reports coming in from the government, regulators, or anybody else that your company is messy and therefore you can raise money for future investments, for greater investments, for diversification and all that great stuff. Just because you're doing things, quote unquote, the correct way. Okay. Uh, number three, it lowers capital cost. Capital cost is simply the cost of borrowing. If your company has a bad reputation, if anybody decides to lend you money, they're gonna lend it to you at higher interest rates. If your company has a good governance record, then you can get money at a considerably lower rate, which of course saves millions and millions of dollars, thousands and thousands of dollars, depending on the size of the company. Okay. Share prices, number four, uh, are positive, which means they tend to show an upward trend. If a company finds itself in reputation or other governance problems, share prices tend to fall. As the problems get more severe, share prices tend to go down to practically nothing. And if something is not done, to get the company back in good graces reputationally and by governance and so on, then that company might eventually either be purchased, or taken over by another company, or end up bankrupt and or out of business. Okay. So these governance issues have very serious consequences if we mess up, but they have great, great benefits if we do things right. Good governance encourage number five, the shareholders and managers and employees even um, to have a greater interest in the company, to invest more money, to be more excited about coming to work and coming up with new ideas and even making suggestions down in the lower level of the organization because they work for a company that they're happy with, they're comfortable with, a pretty good reputation and nobody's telling them you better get out while you can because that company is going under any such thing, okay? So and that's another huge, huge benefit. It builds the morale of all of the stakeholders, including employees. If you look at number six, good corporate governance also minimizes waste and corruption and risks and mismanagement, doggone it which means that bad corporate governance will maximize waste, maximize corruption, maximize risks for the firm, and maximize mismanagement in the company. Hopefully none of you work for such a company. But there are companies like that out there, for sure. Okay? Lurking around waiting to do some nonsense as we speak, okay? Number seven, it helps with brand. Those companies are trying to build brand and name for themselves to get through the development stage, to the maturity stage, to survive the growth stage of their lives and so on. Good governance will help tremendously. They cannot afford a scandal of any kind, especially in the early years of their lives, the development, their growth. Otherwise, they may not get it past first base. And then finally, it ensures that organizations are managed in a manner that is best for all persons. I said that earlier, when organizations practice good corporate governance, everybody benefits. And really, that's what you want ultimately. That is the ultimate goal for organizations at the board and senior management level to do things in such a way that all of the stakeholders, shareholders, board members, senior management, middle management, lower level employees, and everybody else internally and externally. The auditors can come in and not feel pressures like, kiss my foot, what are they gonna ask me to hide this audit year? That, that should never be. I don't need the PACOB to be watching over my firm and giving my audit firm a bad reputation. Then people will not be calling me for those multi-million dollar aud uh, audits. And so you can't have that. The way to avoid those things good governance. It's as simple as that. Well, not as simple as that, but that is the requirement. Okay? 
All right. Does anybody have any questions so far? Has anybody been seeing any issues lately that does not coincide with some of these governance issues that I've rambled on with so far? Okay, just some food for thought. Something to think about. All right, so let's move over then to our notes on guiding principles of corporate governance. And you will notice that once again, it opens up with the board. Always the board for the most part. In the Bahamas, it's the competent authority. In the US, it's Joe Biden. In Russia, it's Putin and so on. Whatever the case might be. In the church, it's the Pope maybe. But it's all the same thing in principle. They're all subject to governance issues and how well they do it or not so well will determine the future of whatever organizations they're a part of. All right, so I need a reader and I'm just going to call a name from the top. And when I call your name, I wish you just start reading beginning with guiding principles of corporate governance. Um, so, Dr. Adderley, are you still there? I'm still here. I'm trying to make sure I'm the same document that you're referring to. Thank you. This is principles, <laughs> governance principles. Uh, guiding principles of corporate governance. That's, okay. that's the second hand up, so to speak. Okay. Yeah, beginning with the board. The board approves corporate strategies that are intended to build sustainable long-term value, selects the chief executive officer, CEO, oversees the CEO and senior management in operating the company's business, including allocating capital for long-term growth and assessing and managing risk and sets the tune at the top, ethical conduct. Uh, Dr. Adi, stick a pin for a moment. Let me just say this before you go on. Uh, yes, we're talking about the board of directors and the CEO uh, and, and shareholders, but bear in mind, these principles apply to any type of board that are led by any type of board members, any type of senior management, whether it's the corporation, the credit union, the church, the country, the whatever it might be, the charity, it doesn't matter. The same principles will apply. We just call these persons by different names, okay? So please keep that. And they're all subject to the same tone at the top, the same ethical conduct, uh, conduct the same allocation. Oh, wow. Oh, we need that generator. I can still hear you now, Andira. No, my, <laughs> sorry, my, my current went off. Oh, I'm trying to hotspot well, this. Obviously, your current, because we can still hear, I think, I think, I don't know, I think somebody else stopped. I, I can't hear um, Mr. Wilkinson anymore. I'm trying a hot spot. How come you can hear? Can anyone else hear me? I can hear you as well. I probably no, I just can't hear Mr. Mr. Wilkinson, Wilkinson or see him. Mr. Probably Wilkinson he lives probably lives where, lives where you live. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got a hot spot my phone and I'm like, ah, generator. Now, you know, now you know you have a neighbor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even Sean laughing at me. Oh Lord. This side of class, this um this um um one let me mute my mic. I don't think we need to hear you 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 and Sean's conversation. <laughs> Sean said hello to Ronaldo. 
<laughs> so Maria, you've been the most talking person in this group so far. Continue the lecture. <laughs> or or this is gonna be like college. If he doesn't come back in five minutes, uh, I'm gone. Oh, his power went off the way. Yeah, he, yeah, we're realizing that his electricity went out. And I have not been the most talkative in this group. No, man, we are we enjoying that. Don't worry about that. Were you at last class? Because I'm hey, sure I was not hey. the most talkative. I, I, I don't know who I'm with <laughs> yeah, now. So we're talking. We're talking. So if we are not the most talkative. But in any event, in any event. Um, <laughs> I don't know. We were just reading the guiding principles, right? I really don't think we need to like read it, read it. Um, we could give him a few more minutes. Okay, yeah. I think it's someone else's time to read. I read yeah. a few paragraphs. You know, we, we trying to duck this class now. <laughs> <laughs> What's the rule? The teacher doesn't show up in 10 minutes and that's it. Oh, um, he's calling me one second. Hi, Mr. Wilkinson. Did your power go off as well? No, mine isn't off, but we all noticed that you um fell off, and I think uh, Tell them a number of us went one off. other person in the class also uh, had power issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, most of us are still here. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, Leah, here's what you do for me, please. Um, Y'all don't laugh. If my lights don't come on in 15 minutes, I'm going to call you back and say to pick it up on Monday, blah, blah, blah. Just to oh, tell him. Okay. okay. We're good. And I'll call you back in 15 minutes. Okay. I'll tell you what you're doing about that and we'll pick it up next week. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. No problem. Bye bye. Um, guys, he's asked, he's asked that we hold on for about 15 minutes to see if his light comes back. If not, he will call me back and, I guess, allow us to dismiss. So we're going to start praying. For the light to come back on or what? For it not to come back on. <laughs> <laughs> Where's her blue tennis was by Oh, yeah, I could have. Yeah, Thea, we, can, we can hear you that you're acting for a blue tennis. I don't know if that could fit me or anybody else in the class. Mm -hmm. hey, I'm even okay, her tennis, the blue one. Oh, Wait, it's going to go on the same Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you say then? Ask Tonette to come here for me. Come, don't let my love out. Yeah. Yes, she needs to school tomorrow. Yeah,
She took blue tennis there, not she didn't go there in the blue tennis. She took blue tennis there the last time. She been over there and she leave it there. Mommy, I like this. Did you leave? Did you find? Did you look at your blue tennis? Touch man, come here. This is cute. I don't know how to find it. Sean, I think that's peachy. I think.
Maria, are you the watchman of the time? I think she was waiting on a phone call from him in 15 minutes. So it wasn't the 15 minutes we were to leave. It was just, he was supposed to call her back. Thank you for that. But believe you me, I, 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 I want to get off this tonight. Real tired. Is 15 minutes up? I think my clock is about 20 minutes. Any response, Maria? We'll pick it up next week. I'll send you guys an email with an update sometime tomorrow. Okay, then I'll let everybody know. Okay. Thanks, Maria. I appreciate that. Okay, no problem. Okay, bye bye. All right, guys, he will send an email, he said, with um, an update on, I guess, on what we have to do next. But no, that's it until next Monday. Okay, y'all have a good night. You too. Thanks so much. Good night, all. All right, good night. Good night. Good night. Are you here?